Uh, this is a presentation called Through the Wire, Measurement and Improvement of a Software-Based IPsec uh, Implementation. Uh, this is work that I've been doing with Jim Thompson at NetGate Rubicon. Uh, Jim couldn't be here this time, but several people from there are in the audience. Um, and let's get started. Uh, so for those of you who have seen previous renditions of this, this is an ongoing series of stand-up network technology comedy. Um, so you may have seen some of the early slides before, but I'll, I'll go through them again for any new people who've walked into the room today. So uh, benchmarks are hard. So for anyone who's ever tried to come up with a reasonable benchmark as opposed to a marketing benchmark, um, it's very difficult. Marketing benchmarks are very easy. Your system is faster than everyone else's or smaller or better or cheaper uh, without any actual scientific backing. But if we move to people who really want to do actual science uh, with a capital S, then benchmarks are you know, a really hard thing to do. And particularly because we have to think about a lot of things. Um, Am I being filmed? And if I am, am I out of frame? I don't know. Someone will come in and yell at me if I'm being filmed. Oh, well, that's, I don't care if I'm in your frame. <laughs> um, I know I'm going out over the internet. So um, benchmarks are hard because we have to figure out things like what do we measure, right? In very basic things. What do we measure? How do we measure it? How do we measure, verify our, our measurements? Um, recently, I've been reading um, a bunch of Edward Tufte's work, The Visual Display of Quantitative Information, for anyone who's sort of a visual statistical geek, really useful books. Um, but one of the things he says all the time is compared to what, right? So when we're doing things like benchmarks or showing statistics, the question is compared to what? Um, so we have to come up with things that are measurable. Um, we'd like to come up with measurements that can be repeated and replicated, right? So those two things are actually slightly different. I could repeat a ton of measurements, but if no one else in the room or no one else on the internet can replicate those measurements, they're not very useful. It turns out that science kind of requires this replication thing, which is why we have yet to have cold fusion. Um, so, and then last, uh, not quite lastly, but sort of in the set of things where we're thinking about what we measure and how we measure, me measure it, um, is our measurement relevant? So it is not atypical for people who have been working very hard on a particular problem, whether it's optimizing something or, in this case, we're always going to be talking about optimizing, but in particular, optimizing something uh, to become very narrowly focused. Now, I realize that software engineers as a group never do this. We never become overly focused on one particular part of our code. That never happens. But it, you know, just in case it happens to you. Um, so one of the things we have to think about is, is the measurement relevant to what we're trying to solve? Right? And uh, one of my favorite lines from some folks I used to work with at Yahoo and their Paranoids team is, so what problem are you trying to solve? Um, so these are kind of the, the base standards by which you should measure a benchmark. Right? You know, what, how, compared to what, verifying your measurement, all of these things. Um, lastly, and this is something that people who are first coming to work on uh, um, measurement technology don't really think about is that, you know, especially if you're working with package software, right? So in FreeBSD, we're generally not working with so much package software. We've got stuff that, you know, we can sort of see the source code to. But, you know, someone hands you a tool and says, well, you know, this tool generates foobar when you run something through it. Um, the measurement tools often disturb the measurements themselves, right? And I call this Heisen testing, sort of related to the idea of a Heisen bug, which is that your measurement framework and your measurement technology disturb the thing that you're trying to measure. Um, if it disturbs it really badly, it kills your cat. So networking benchmarks, so that was just benchmarks in general. You think about benchmarking you know, the operating system or a CPU or some other piece of technology. Uh, network benchmarks are harder uh, for all of the reasons that networking is either, depending on your point of view, really fun or really aggravating. Um, so, or both. Uh, I had hair when I started working in networking. I pulled it all out. So. Uh, for reasons of asynchrony, right? So in networking, things can happen quite asynchronously. This is also true of disks and other things that don't communicate across the network. But if a disk drops a block, it's a fatal error. If your NIC drops a packet, it's just Tuesday, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how that works. You know, when you, anyone who's taken an undergraduate networking course, one of the things that you learn about in packet switched networks is, well, it's best effort. So. Uh, I've said this many times, but I enjoy this joke too many times to let it die. Uh, why I like to work on networking is because I can keep dropping your data all the time and you'll keep giving me more of it. 
right? So here's a packet. Whoops. Here's a packet. Whoops. Here's a packet. Oh, well, I'll deliver that one. Here's a packet. Whoops. And people just keep giving us data. You know, as Kirk points out in his history of file systems talk, you curdle someone's data on disk once and they never trust you ever again. But in networking, people are really, it's, it's fine. People are really trusting. Um, and this third point is actually getting better. And I, I will take slight credit for this. It is getting better in some ways because I've been giving this talk. So many people have developed their own test frameworks and test software. And you only discover them when you give a talk, say, at FOSDEM in front of you know, several hundred people or at a BSD conference. You're like, there are no tools for this. And three people come up to you and go, well, we wrote a tool. And you're like, uh-huh. Did you open source it? It's, yeah, it's in our own internal Git or Subversion or if they're really crazy CVS. Um, but you know, it's, uh, it reminds me of the line from uh, uh, Dr. Strangelove, which is the whole thing about if you're going to make a doomsday device, it only works as a deterrent if you tell someone, right? So testing tools are only useful if you tell someone that you have them. Um, so that's getting better as you know these kinds of talks have gone out and I've been collecting these things together and putting them online in various places, easier to find. Um, and then the last thing is controlling a distributed system, <clears throat> which I think putting control and distributed systems in a sentence should actually be considered comedy. Um, because as you know, most people who are trying to test something very simple just SSH into nine machines and hit return really fast. Right? <laughs> that is not control of a distributed system. That's Wednesday. So these are the reasons that network benchmarks are, I think, harder than a sort of a standard single system benchmark. Um, coming into this now is you know the speeds at which things happen. So if you look at the evolution of hardware and software over the last 20 or certainly the last 30 years, um, the assumptions that we make and the things that happen in systems are very different. Um, once upon a time, processor speed was the thing, right? Your processor could, you know, was the bottleneck for almost everything in the system except for when, you know, you were using drum storage. And there's only three of us in the room who can know what drum storage was. Yeah, one, two, there's a third. Four. Fine. Um, but, you know, when you're getting up to, I mean, now a 10 gig NIC is slow, right? I mean, I can buy a 10 gig NIC for not pocket change, but, you know, a nice dinner. Um, yes. I'm getting to that point. Um, so modern hardware makes this more complicated because things are happening incredibly fast and you don't have, you know, your NIC is effectively in some ways faster than, than a single core on your CPU in terms of what's going on. Um, so on a 10 gig NIC, you only have 67 nanoseconds or 200 cycles at 300 gigahertz to make a decision, right? So if you're trying to measure things, then you are, unless you have a really, really lightweight, really good measurement system, going to miss a lot of effects, right? Because they're all going to be hidden under, you know, everything else that's going on. Now, if you multiply this by 4 or you multiply it by 10, then you know how to divide. Everyone here knows how to divide. Um, and you can see how expensive this becomes. Added to this is this problem where cycles are cheaper than they once were, but the one thing that is not cheaper is cache misses. So when you're doing high-performance computing, which is the kind of place you might apply this sort of uh, technology, this sort of testing methodology, um, a lot of people will look at cycles per instruction or, you know, like how, how busy is the software. But actually, that's not the key measurement and a lot that has not caught up to a lot of people. The key measurement is how many times did I blow out my cache? Because every time you blow out your cache, you are actually ruining your performance. And this comes down to the previous slide where we were talking about relevant measurement, right? If you are measuring only for how many cycles per instruction or you know, how, what's the hottest spot in the code just for CPU-based measurements, you are probably missing the most important bottleneck in your system, uh, which is memory pressure and in particular cache misses. Uh, other things that are making things ma that feed into this, um, nobody has a 30 gigahertz one core processor, right? You have a three gigahertz 10 core processor. Um, because supposedly multi-threaded, multi-processor programs will be much, much more efficient once we figure out how to do locking without shooting our feet off. Um, so all of your CPUs are multi-core. Uh, all of the, in the case of a network benchmark, all of your network NICs that do 10 gig or above are multi-queue. Um, and if you don't line up your uh, test correctly, this is getting the test right, such that things don't bounce around between cores and queues, you are going to artificially lower your performance, right? You will not be able to measure the correct performance if things start moving around. Um, and this is another consideration people need to take into account when they're doing network benchmarks. I 
Hello. Hello. Macy's code crashed during this. I'm going to find him. Hmm. All right. So I guess we're going to switch to the other laptop. Yeah, except they don't have a converter. Let me just do this. There's a thing on one side of this. There it is. Actually, let me see what's on my screen before I put it up on the screen. That would be wild. <laughs> just saying. I don't know what could possibly go wrong. I definitely don't want IRC on <laughs> for reasons that are obvious by the number of people laughing. Wow. Um, all right, so let's talk about why network benchmarks are hard by plugging this in. I don't do graphics now. I just try to use them and fail badly, it would seem. <coughs> yeah. All right, so displays. There we go. Well, at least my, my laptop is flashing around. Could be. Ah, yes. I like having smart people in my audience so I don't completely screw up my talks. Doesn't love that. Default. No, I'm going really small. Flashy, flashy. There it is. It detected something. Arrangement. I did think that works hard. Does anyone have the, the VGA dongle? Because Dan took mine. Throw me a VGA dongle and we'll see how this goes. Clearly this is not working. Yeah, throw. Throw a little harder. <laughs> Where is it? Throw further. Thank you. Uh, let's try this again. I'm glad the Mac doesn't work. <laughs> it just proves a point. It makes, it makes me feel better. I think this will usually work.
Yay! <laughs> a round of applause for graphics working. Nope, it's right here. So let's talk a little bit more about this. Let me plug this silly thing back in. And take my laser. All right, so I was talking about, what was I talking about? This is what I was talking about. Um, talking about how expensive cash misses are, right? So um, in particular, what your cycle budget is at certain packet processing times. So um, generally, people will test networking systems using the smallest possible packet because it causes the largest amount of pain. Uh, these are all numbers for 10 gig, so multiply by 4 for 40 or 10 for uh, 100 gig. And yes, we do, we FreeBSD do run on 100 gig, the one in front actually runs it in production. Um, so this is your cycle budget, and it only gets worse. So one of the things I wanted to do early on was to build up some test automation for this kind of system so I didn't have to log into nine machines and press enter. Uh, so I wrote this thing called Conductor, set of Python libraries. You can find it on GitHub. Um, and Conductor is a very, very simple scripting system for running tests in a distributed system. So you have a uh, system called the Conductor, and you have a bunch of players, and you run your players, and the Conductor communicates with them over a, a network connection. I very strongly recommend that if you are testing networking, you do not have your control network and your test network as the same network, because that will cause wrong. what could possibly go wrong. Don't do that. Um, Conductor is really simple. Four phases, start up, run, collect, reset. Uh, this is the one that everyone, when they write their first uh, test you know, framework, leaves out, which is you want to run a test in a consistent state. That means you have to reset everything possible that you can think of at the end of the run, or at the beginning. I happen to put it at the end. Um, so that you can clear ARP caches or clear tables that might have been set up and which would bias your measurement. The whole point is to remove as much bias as possible from your measurements, unlike a marketing benchmark in which you wish to introduce bias. Um, so Conductor is super simple. It uses the, um, uh, the config library from Python. You can have as many uh, different players or clients set up. Uh, you can actually also put in trials. This is another thing that people often leave out of benchmarks. Like, well, I ran it once, and it was fast. Great. How statistically significant is that? Uh, they usually say, what? Uh, so this is a simple test, only one trial. This is the I would like to get it working. Um, this is the little horrific scripting language that's in Conductor. I am not proud of this, um, but at some point it may get better. And that being said, um, you know I've been using Conductor now for a couple of years since I wrote it. Uh, happily, there are other people who are working on this problem. Um, and if you look in the current... Um, uh, set of ports, you'll see a new benchmarking port, which is called Zopkio. So Zopkio is a distributed systems benchmarking system done by the folks at LinkedIn. Um, Marcelo Arroyo, who's at um, Gandhi, has put a port in for that. So I'm starting to look at that as a replacement to conductor for coordinating these tests. Um, some people have actually made it work pretty well for some simple tests. I want to see if it'll work better for this. Um, it doesn't really solve the scripting problem because it's written in Python, and I like Python, don't get me wrong, but you wind up writing all of your tests in Python. There isn't sort of a more abstract testing language. So um, one of the things we, we'd like to develop, of course, is a baseline. Uh, these are my two common use baselines for uh, benchmarking. Uh, iperf, actually iperf3, iperf has gone through a couple of revisions. Um, is what I use for a standard TCP test because it will just do a very easy uh, TCP test that's easy to run. Uh, if you really want to abuse the system, which often is our goal, um, using PackageN is uh, currently the best thing you can use on FreeBSD, and it's actually really good. So PackageN is a, a little thing that um, Luigi Rizzo added when he did NetMap, and it exploits NetMap as a way of blasting packets at line rate uh, at another host. Um, it can't do things like TCP straight transitions, um, but if you just want to generate raw packets as a way of seeing what will happen when they get to the other end, PackageN is, is for you. And I've been making a bunch of updates to PackageN over time as well. So, you know, here's a simple TCP measurement. This is the output of iperf3. 
Um, this is a host to host test over 10 gig. And we see that we're getting, you know, 9.4 gigabits per second TCP traffic uh, on a 10 gig link. So clearly we are done, right? Because we got the bandwidth we needed. It's <laughs> nothing else to see here. Um, so with TCP, of course, TCP's whole goal is to fairly share the network. Well, that's not true. FreeBSD's TCP goal is to fairly share the network. Other people have different ideas when they put in certain congestion control algorithms. But um, because it's meant to do that, as long as there are CPU and network resources available, it will balance out at the top number. And that's why this works. Um, but let's say we would take the same machines and try to just run minimum size packets through them, right? So on the source, we see you know, our nearly 14.8 million packets per second. And on the sync, I really need, we need more commas. Uh, you don't see 14 million packets here. So where do the, where do the magic packets go? So clearly, um, the system is not able to absorb all packets at full speed. And there's a bunch of reasons for this. So um, in the TCP test, we're using full size packets. And that's going to be the lowest impact on the uh, network stack software and on the um, NIC software and on everything in the system. Because per packet, the amount of overhead and the amount of work you have to do is very small. Um, package gen is, the package gen test is using minimum size packets for Ethernet. And that's going to you know, exercise the system as much as possible. But there's one other thing. Any modern 10 gig NIC has a large number of hardware offload features, right? So checksum offloading, large receiver offloading, um, there's a whole bunch of things that the NIC is actually doing for you. I mean, there are NICs that do complete offload, TCP offload engines, but I don't trust them. <coughs> Hope he's not deep in the room. He doesn't like me when I say that. Um, but anyway, uh, so all of those hardware features mean that you're really not testing the OS software. So if, if my goal is to test FreeBSD, which generally is my goal, um, then I need to know which features are there that I need to turn off in order to do a valid test, right? At the moment, this test is actually not valid. Um, maximum size packets, all the hardware features are on. If you start turning hardware features off, you actually exercise the software, and we do not get 10 gigabits. And DSO is the other one, right? TCP segment offload. We have LRO. No, there's LRO on the card, too. Yeah, depending on the card. Um, so I wanted to talk this time around, um, that's sort of the background, about some work we did looking at the performance of IPSEC. So um, this is kind of an obvious statement, but I put it on the slide anyway. Encryption is computationally expensive. That's kind of the goal. <laughs> um, so until you have a quantum NIC, which <laughs> thankfully we don't have yet, because that would make debugging even harder. Um, the encryption and decryption of data, you know, is expensive. And so traditionally over time, this is, there have been various ways of dealing with this. There used to be offloaded, there used to be whole offloaded cards. That's not me. Anyway, someone's back. Um, either that or it's telling me I'm already done, which I'm not. So. Uh, over time, there have been uh, coprocessor offloads to handle encryption, and so you see these in VPN devices and high-end devices. Um, but you're also now seeing certain standards uh, where the offloadable uh, acceleration instructions are right in the chip. So one of the examples of this that we wanted to measure was AESNI, which is the, I guess, the current latest encryption system um, that's being used. And there are specialized instructions for this in modern ARM and Intel and other processors. And those instructions mean you don't have to use an offload card. Uh, it can be done right on the CPU, but you still have to have a framework within which to use it. And that was our goal was to measure that. Um, so how do we measure a VPN? Um, you can't simply do a host to host test because you want to actually separate the uh, overhead that is induced by the VPN software from the overhead that is induced by, for instance, dealing with TCP, right? So all of the you know, work that goes in the TCP stack, we want to avoid that. We want a raw set of packets going across the tunnel. So we have a source, VPN left, VPN right, and a sync. Um, first test, it, we were testing this actually using iperf3 over TCP because we weren't so concerned about full size versus small packets just yet. Um, and we used uh, conductor to set up the tests. And then we have 10 rounds 
of 10 seconds each. IPERF tends to run a 10 second test. Now, is this statistically significant? There's actually a test of that. Um, and uh, I actually don't remember. But um, <laughs> it is 10 rounds seem to be a reasonable number. If you want to know the exact number, because it would be fewer or more, uh, I refer to Raj Jain, who would actually be able to tell us. Uh, the Jain book I'll mention at the end. But this seemed like a reasonable set of first tests. Um, here's our lab setup. So um, these are machines that exist in the uh, <coughs> um, FreeBSD Centex test lab, uh, which is actually somewhere near here, uh, near here being Ottawa. So uh, using only Chelsea cards, so we could remove one of the variables, like you could have had a mix of Intel and Chelsea, et cetera, but I prefer not to mix them if I don't have to. Um, you know, we can go all the way from, I think this is our sync. So this is our source. This is VPN right. This is VPN left. We need to switch to get through here. Oh, we do have one Intel card. And then uh, Lion 1 just sort of absorbs packets and counts them. But all of the drops and all the, all the bottleneck we're going to see are actually here. And so we're seeing that across a, uh, identical cards. Um, hardware used. So this is something that if you read well-written you know, systems papers, you will always see that this in, is in there, right? Um, which is, what hardware were you using for this particular test? I probably should have also included the version of the OS, uh, which for me is basically head of a date, because I'm always testing on head, so I just pick a date and put a tag in. Um, you can see that uh, you know, these guys are all using T5 cards, this is the number of cores, and Clearly, Rabbit 3, is the ingress VPN, is going to be the bottleneck because it's got a smaller number of cores across which you can stream a bunch of data. So who's ever heard of a null encryption? Oh, excellent. You all pass. Um, who knew that it didn't work in FreeBSD until I fixed it six months ago? Oh, only three of us. Well, you, Chris, cheats. We work together. <laughs> um, so. No, I mean, I mean, I mean, no one had actually tried to use the option to turn it on in so long that when you turned it on, it's like, no, that we don't have that. I'm like, yes, you do. The code's right there. Um, so, you know, you please never deploy null encryption in a product. Someone's going to, I know it, but please don't be one of the people in this room. Um, the reason you want null encryption, though, is one of the things we wanted to determine was the overhead induced by the actual framework, right? We want to know how much the IPSEC framework, not the encryption algorithms, are a source of um, bottle, you know, a source of overhead. So we use the, I mean, and this is literally, it's nice when you can fit the entire function, both of them, on the slide. This is literally what the code is. Um, it's just like, here's a function call, have a nice day. Um, and this is called the null, null methods. There's no authentication, no encryption. And then I turned off TCP offload on the NIC cards. Right, so I turned off all the hardware features that could actually accelerate any TCP on the VPN cards. Um, yeah, who needs null encryption? By the way, this angered me so much, there's an entire code vicious column, which is my column, about why you would have null encryption, because I was really annoyed. Um, so if we have null encryption and we take all the features off, um, on a 10 gig link, we get slightly less than five gig. Uh, this is gigabits per second. This is our standard deviation. So. Um, uh, this is actually, no, this is with IPSEC off. So just turning off the hardware features reduces the performance of uh, our software stack over 10 gig by 50%. Yeah, well, right, but not good. Um, yeah. Um, so this is the baseline we're starting from. If we had tried to, I mean, if we wanted to compare against full 10 gig, which is sort of a theoretical maximum, and then this is the pragmatic maximum, um, and then next we'll talk about what we actually find in practice for any of the IPSEC code. So um, some of the questions we wanted to answer w weren't just, you know, how slow is it? Because, you know, at the end of the day, you don't want to basically put out a paper or presentations. It's like, oh, it sucks. I mean, you know, many of us come here and say that, but that's not really, we want to go further than that. So one of the things we did was we used HWPMC, which is the, uh, device that gives you access to per performance monitoring counters on the CPU uh, to collect a bunch of statistical data or a bunch of code data. And we wanted to know things like, you know, where does the time go? Um, 
are we slow because you know things are are computationally expensive? Like, is it just the fact that certain algorithms, when in, uh, you know implemented in software, are much slower than they are in hardware? We'll see that on a future slide. Um, and then again, that question that we uh, talked about at the very beginning: Are we abusing the cache? So a node about HWP PMC, I talked about um, Heisen testing and you know your tools affecting the outcome of the test. Um, HWP PMC definitely has what we call a probe effect. Uh, there's also a concept here called uh, measurement skid. So you'll start and stop a measurement, and, and the system will keep collecting past the end of it, or get some you know you won't get nice clean lines at the edge of your graph. Um, <clears throat> It would be nice to have independent verification. Um, there is now someone working on this kind of stuff by uh, bringing up FreeBSD, or they've brought up FreeBSD on Gem5, which is an instruction, a cycle accurate instruction simulator. Right? Good. I always forget how to say that. Uh, who's uh, Bjorn Z at uh, University of Cambridge. Many people know him because he's worked a lot on our IPv6 code. He's working on stuff to be able to b verify this against itself. Um, we could also use better visualization tools. <laughs> we could actually use visualization tools because, you know, kernel programmers don't do GUIs, or at least I don't. And so, you know, if you like curses, you're all set. Um, but we could use some tools that would give us a better way of sort of going in towards the data and coming out from the data. So one of the things we wanted to do, and this is a, a, an example output from GProf, which is older than dirt but um, still very effective. So when you do a collection of uh, instruction or cache data or any of the data from HWPMC, um, you can then feed it through GProf, and this is kind of the best visualization we currently have. Um, and what you can see here is it's showing you, you know, how much of the percentage of this, is, this ha happens to be instructions are being used by bi different functions. So, and you can see here, um, that, well, this makes a lot of sense because everything's going to go through IP input, everything's going to go through IP forward, and then it's going to get to ESP4 input, which is the routine that handles the ESP protocol. There you'll see AH or ESP, depending on if you're encrypting or authenticating. Um, and then you see a whole bunch of other work going on here. But what's interesting, and what you usually find in a uh, multi core, multi threaded kernel, is that, oh, look, locking, right? So, Locking's a good idea. <laughs> it turns out not to be free. And so one of the things that we wind up doing when we're, perform, uh, when we're doing performance analysis or optimization on the kernel is going back, looking at the locks we put in when we first made the kernel run on multiple cores and deciding which of those are appropriate. Right? So the process by which one normally um, multi-threads a single-threaded kernel, uh, for those of you who've had the pleasure, um, is that you first put a giant lock around the kernel. So anything that goes into the kernel, giant lock. And that's really slow <laughs> um, because any operation requires you to take and, and release that lock. Um, and so then people go in and they're like, okay, well, we're going to lock every data structure. And then we're going to make sure we don't have lock order reversals between them, usually. Um, <laughs> sometimes they get it wrong. But that means that you then wind up with a lot of locks. So you go from no lock, one lock, a lot of locks, and then the job of a lot of performance analysis and optimization on these kinds of systems is, what's the fewest number of locks we can get away with um, and still have the system execute safely and securely and get the maximum amount of performance out of the largest number of cores, right? Because it's about scaling. So we are not surprised to see that this is going on here. Um, another type of output, so this is, this is going down, right? This is like a stack trace. Um, this next one is what we call a flat profile. This shows up at the end of GProf. And this is just telling you what are the most expensive things just generally, right? So this is not a stack trace. So there's still some idle time. Ignore that. Um, you know, it's a multi-core machine. There, hopefully, if you weren't running multiple things through there. But we now see that the most expensive things here in the null encryption profile where we're not doing any interesting math are all of the bits of overhead. Here's locks, here's B copy, B0, the UMA system, which is the memory system within um, FreeBSD itself. These are the most expensive bits of overhead in the IPSEC framework itself, right? Removing any encryption or authentication, the things that cost a lot are, you know, unsurprising, um, but, you know, we're happy to find that our bias is confirmed, that we believe that this would, you know, 
Anyone who works on kernels, the first thing they would say is it's slow because of the locking. Surprise. Not so much. Uh, it is. Yeah. And you know, it's the read-write locks. So one of the things we're looking at, which has not been in this presentation, is whether or not switching the read-write locks to a read-many lock or a re, uh, an RM lock might help. Um, initial reports on that are not positive. It seems to take about as much time. Um, OK, let's move on. So now let's talk about um, you know, introducing some actual encryption and authentication algorithms. So one of the algorithms we tested, which we tested because it could use hardware support, um, was AES CBC in tunnel mode. Uh, it's encryption with SHA-1 authentication. So even with hardware support, um, we have about the same performance. And that is because the SHA-1 is the bottleneck, right? So SHA-1 you know, was done in software. There's, there's no AES and I isn't going to do it, right? Like the only offload we have. Um, but when we get to GCM, which is what people are using a lot, um, we can finally take advantage of these AES and I instructions that are on the CPU. So now we see something that makes us a lot happier. Well, not that happy because our maximum speed is only 1.8 gigs uh, on a 10 gig link, but it's way better than 281 megabits, right? Which is kind of pitiful. Um, so this is using AES GCM as both encrypting and authenticating, but it's not using that SHA-1 algorithm. Um, and these are 128 bit keys with and without hardware support. So. Correct. So the AES and I, yeah, the soft, when it says soft here, it means we do not have the AES and I offload loaded into the kernel. Uh, hard means we do use AES and I as a way of accelerating this work. Yes. Uh, I should probably keep repeating the question. The question is this is the AES and I in OCF. OCF is the Open Crypto Framework, which we got from OpenBSD. Um, and NetBSD and FreeBSD both have it. Um, and so John Mark Gurney added support for AES and I instructions to OCF. That's what's happening here. Um, so this is another one of these tables of instructions retired. Um, this is without, yes, this is without hardware offload. And what we see, which is completely unsurprising, is that there's a whole bunch of crypto routines that are really, really expensive. Um, now, we still see things like data moving around being expensive, uh, but look, the lock has gone all the way down here, right? Locks are still expensive, but they don't compare to math, right? Math is hard. Let's go shopping. Um, if we come to the flat profile, it becomes even more obvious. Um, this is the 128-bit multiply. This is the, it's, AESGCM uses a, the Rindle routines to do this. There's still a little idle time. Um, and then you don't even see read-write read, lock in this top one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight. in the top nine. <coughs> it's not even there. Um, there's still a bunch of memory stuff. M copy data and copy back are the M buff copy routines, but most of this is math is hard. Um, if we then look at the same sort of flat profile while we've got AES and I turned on, we come back to the fact that it's nearly identical to the null profile. Right, so this is this is one way of showing that the hardware offload is working. Right, the hardware offload has removed all of that math that we saw on the previous table, and we're back to the overhead we had before. Right, so if we go all the way back to here, no, nope, four. There we are. I've got a full table up at the end. If we go all the way back to here. We see that this is 1.8. That is 1.8, which is still, it's not as much as it is when everything is off, uh, but it's very close to uh, what we will find when we talk about IPSEC uh, being introduced without encryption. There's a summary table at the end of the slides. So math is hard. Um, so when we have the CPU freed for other work, then the bottleneck goes right back to what it was before. Um, Locking and memory management dominate the remaining measurements, right? So this confirms our suspicions of, from the null measurements, and 
What this tells us, if you look inside the code, which is the thing you ultimately want to do by running one of these benchmarks, I mean, we don't just run them to generate tables. I mean, tables are cool. Um, but the thing we want to do is eventually get back to looking at the code. And I can't show all of the code on even 10 slides, um, but I can tell you that the, IPSE, the current IPSEC and OCF frameworks in all the BSDs um, handle things packet at a time, right? So all of these things we see in the flat, flat profile where locking and memory management are expensive are in part due to the fact that the way we handle packets in the system is to say, oh, I have a packet. Oh, it's IPSEC. Oh, I've got to go up here. Oh, let me take some locks. Oh, let me allocate some memory. Let me hand this off to this thing and then let me come back. Um, the way to do high performance networking is to actually bat batch packets as much as possible. And the only time you don't want to batch packets is when you care about low latency. So that's always the trade-off. The trade-off is bandwidth versus latency. If you are a financial hedge fund, you care more about latency. If you are anyone else in the world, mostly except for a time protocol, which we will not go into today, um, you care more about bandwidth. So this packet at a time system that we, you know, we've had for a long time um, worked until systems got faster and faster that the overhead induced by packet at a time work eventually swamped our ability to you know, run at line rate. So we're not going to talk about this. Um, we will talk about this. So I get to check this off after today. Um, I like to call this an ongoing longitudinal study. Um, in the previous uh, talks, I've talked about various other parts of FreeBSD. This one was about IPSEC. Um, we are still optimizing IPSEC, and there will be more measurements about it, but I don't expect to do another talk on IPSEC specifically. Uh, the thing I have turned my sights on next is TCP. So that means I now have work for the rest of my life, because you can basically give a TP TCP performance talk every year, and it will still be new. Um, I believe, depending on what the program committee says, uh, that I may be doing one of these at EuroBSD. So, um, not only is the framework open source, but all of the measurements and all of the test uh, files are open source as well. You'd have to customize them for your own network. Um, but if you go to my netperf uh, repo on GitHub, <clears throat> you'll find tests for you know, vanilla systems, IPSEC, IPFW, PF, and I just started introducing some for TCP. So if you want an advanced view of what I might give in a TCP talk, you can go look at the TCP test. And that's the last slide. So, any questions? See, I, I did 800 milliwatts and then I got done on time. Did you look at the difference in annotation of the CPU um, in particular pulling up the shell is faster than going up them and the ISAL libraries that use Yasmin are even faster than that. So you can get quite a speed up by using, using those. So the question is, did I look at any other uh, source bases besides the one that's currently in FreeBSD that was done by John Mark? Uh, the answer is no, but it's a, that actually means I might wind up doing another IPSEC talk. I think if you can help me get a hold of it, sir. That would be cool. That run in the PUC talk. Okay. <laughs> other questions? So the question is, is, was this version of Ike, was this Ike or Ike v2? This is actually all set up by hand. So the way I was able to find out that set key didn't work is, uh, that null didn't work is by the fact that I coded it all by hand with set key. Um, Ike and Ike v2 and Raccoon and all those things are, they're, they're fine, uh, but they make setting the thing up even more difficult. So there's no SA or child SA associations or anything? It's all no. set by hand, and it's all pre-shared keys. Okay. So, um, and you know the pre-shared keys are random strings that I happen to type in uh, that were the right size. So, um, do you have a question, or you just okay? Other questions? Yes. Um, I did not do any timing for SHA two. The question is, did I do timing for SHA two? I did not do timing for SHA two because the SHA 
uh, thing was just there to show what would happen if we had a hardware offload but still had a software bottleneck. So it wasn't as important. Um, I don't think we would find without hardware acceleration that SHA-2 would be particularly faster, but I could go take a look. <laughs> the answer was probably slower. Well, there you go. So I could make, I could make it more dramatic yeah, by doing that. Exactly. You could get one megabit across this 10 gigabit link with SHA-2. Anything else? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, so that was the whole reason to do it. So the question is, do we have plans to improve it now that we've looked at it? Yes. Um, so I've been doing various fixes across IPSEC. Uh, the thing that uh, uh, many of us have been talking about is not improving IPSEC specifically, but improving OCF. Um, in particular, trying to figure out a way to make the FreeBSD network stack generally uh, capable of batching, right? And that would help all protocols, right? So that would help vanilla for forwarding and IPSEC and reception of packets. Um, it turns out that that is non-trivial to do with 20 to 30 years of history of packet at a time, um, but we are definitely looking at it. And we've done <coughs> things like that before. I mean, we went, f we went to a direct dispatch mode uh, for processing, and that actually has helped a lot. Yes? So the question is, has anyone tried you know, the slew of new possible locking schemes? Um, the answer to my, to my knowledge is no. I've started looking at RM lock. I actually am considering using concurrency kit. The problem is that relocking a network stack, getting it right, and then benchmarking it is going to take a while. Um, one of the reasons that I wrote Conductor and the NetPerf repo was so that other people could be like, well, I've got an idea. Like, you know, perhaps you are interested in concurrency kit and want to try that. Um, I'm really hoping people will take that and use it. Um, would I like to spend, you know, a lot of time probably locked in a prison cell working on that? Yes, but I would detract from my other work. You'd have to be in a prison cell to get it done. Wait, equilibrium from someone here. Oh, um, so that's Olivier's work, Olivier Couchard. Um, so I have not used that specifically yet. The nice thing is that, so for those of you who don't know, one of the people who works on the network stack and who does a great deal of uh, benchmarking is Olivier Couchard, the BSD Rider project. So he actually tracks our tracks FreeBSD performance over time. If you look at BSD RP, you all have laptops. Um, you'll see that. Um, his setup requires a little more setup even than ours. Um, so I would be more likely, and he and I are talking about Zopkio stuff. He and I talk a lot. Um, <clears throat> I would probably be more likely to try and, and move to Zopkio because it's something everyone can share more easily. Um, but uh, his approach is fine. I, the theoretical approach is fine. Um, the question of whether we would use that tool versus another one is is currently undetermined. But the BSDRP stuff is really is really good. Anything else? I believe there are cookies now. Um, all right. Thank you very much.